Hi, I'm Russ of Aquarimax, and today I'll be talking about what may be my most otherworldly pets, my tailless whip scorpions. Now, tailless whip scorpions are arachnids, like spiders or scorpions, and share some characteristics of each. But they're not true spiders, they're not true scorpions. When you look at them, you can notice a few things right away. One are their very long, thin uh, structures known as antenniform legs. They're actually legs, but they've been modified to function as antennae. They can sense uh, chemicals, so basically they um, serve as organs of taste and smell, as well as organs of touch. And they sometimes use them to corral their prey. They never use those legs to walk. And then they have three other pairs of legs, and that's you know, the eight legs of uh, arachnids, but then they have these two other structures, these long spiky arm-like structures in the front. Those are pedipalps, and they are analogous to the uh, pedipalps that a scorpion has, uh, commonly known as pinchers. So they use those structures to capture their prey. Now, unlike spiders or scorpions, they're not venomous. They have chelicerae, which are the answer to jaws for arachnids that they use to eat their prey in common with spiders and scorpions but no venom. So they rely upon their pedipalps to catch and hold their prey and then they just use their chelicerae to slowly eat their prey. They're found in many parts of the world mostly in tropical and subtropical areas. We have a few species of amblypygids in uh, the United States in fact. There's one in Florida and there are one or two that are found in uh, the southwest in places like Arizona. This particular species is uh, generally found in Tanzania and areas um, near there and the scientific name is Damon Diadema which means something like demon's crown and I can kind of see that I can imagine it looks kind of like a tiara if that were perched right on my forehead it would look a little bit like a tiara maybe I don't know some kind of crown. Very interesting creatures in many many ways and I, I'm this is just the tip of the iceberg one interesting fact about them is that they can recognize their own offspring the mother carries eggs in a special pouch um, for a while until they hatch and then she carries the babies on her back until they molt and are ready to take care of themselves kind of similar to how scorpions do it and then uh, she actually takes care of the offspring for some time and will recognize them by smell. Scientific studies have been done demonstrating that she can recognize her own offspring as opposed to the offspring of another female. So very very interesting that way. The siblings will stay together until they reach a certain age and then they will start to disperse before they get too aggressive with one another. But uh, adults apparently uh, will live together sometimes in the wild and many people keep them together in captivity and that can work, it doesn't always work, but now that you have kind of an introduction to what uh, my whiplings or amblies or tailless whip scorpions are, I'm going to tell you about how I care for them. Well, let's talk about their housing first. Well, I have some fairly small enclosures. It's kind of surprising that such a large invertebrate would need a small enclosure, but they are used to living in places like uh, the holes in trees, you know, hollows inside trees or inside caves or rock crevices, places like that, where they're fairly confined and contained, and they actually uh, feel the need for an enclosed space, so they seek those out. So a small enclosure is not bad, it's, it's a good thing, as long as it's large enough for them to molt um, safely. So we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But as you can see, these enclosures are fairly small, but they're just about the right size uh, for them to feel secure. Um, I do have a larger enclosure that I'm going to be put putting them in for breeding as well, and I'll show that in just a minute. Well, as I was saying, these creatures need to have a space to molt in, and as you can see, the back of the enclosure features uh, a sheet of cork bark. Now, there are only certain surfaces on which uh, tailless whip scorpions can safely live. They, they spend most of their lives in a vertical position, but they need something fairly soft to grip on. In the wild, this might be tree bark, or it might be a mossy rock or something like that, that they can grip on. And in captivity, you need to give them something that's soft enough so that it does not wear down their claws. So cork bark is a popular option. Uh, it's very similar to what they would live on in the wild. It allows them to grip and it does not wear down their claws. Another popular option is polystyrene foam. And I have kept them both on polystyrene foam and on cork bark. Um, both work. 
Some advantages of the polystyrene form is that they're very visible. Their dark colors stand out against the polystyrene foam. It's very easy to see and uh, to watch them hunt and those sorts of things. But they do camouflage better on the cork bark and it does look a little bit more natural. So both are popular options. I learned about using the polystyrene from um, Wizentrop on arachno boards and I'll actually leave a thread or I'll leave a link to a thread um, on arachno boards about that whole process and how he explains how it works and so on if you're interested in trying that out. But like I said, they do not need a very large enclosure. They do need um, humidity. And to maintain humidity, I put uh, usually cocoa fiber, about an inch or so of cocoa fiber on the bottom of the enclosure and keep that moist and that helps maintain the humidity. And I usually put small isopods and springtails in with them to help uh, prevent mold and to help eat um, uneaten food and um, take care of any um, molted skins and so on that they, they drop. So uh, I also put a small water dish in there to make sure that they get water. They will drink water from a dish. I will also spray the sides of the enclosure and the, the misting, they will, they will take droplets from the sides of the enclosure too. So that's how I maintain humidity and then it's essentially very easy uh, to take care of. As you can see, I have a lid here that um, has a few holes drilled in it and then I've covered that with a very fine weave fabric to keep things like fungus gnats out and that, that works very well. These lids close very tightly so that hasn't been a problem. And now let's talk about maintenance and feeding. This is also pretty easy. They tend to eat small invertebrates. When they were very, very small, when I got them, they, I received three of them in what I believe was a two ounce deli cup at the time. They were very, very tiny. And at that point, they were eating small springtails, they would eat uh, wingless fruit flies and that sort of thing. As they got older, they began to take small crickets. And that has essentially been their main diet since then. When they were younger, I would feed them maybe twice a week and they were growing faster, molting more frequently. And now as they're older, I feed them every one to two weeks, depending on the season. When it's warmer, they tend to want to eat a little bit more. In the winter, they tend not to want to eat a lot. So they're very, very easy to feed. Um, I have heard that other insects can be better for them than crickets. Um, I, they don't really eat mealworms or anything like that. If you put a mealworm in there, they tend to burrow into the substrate immediately. So that's, that doesn't work very well. But things like moths and so on, if you were to capture them in the wild, they would probably respond well to those, but I'm worried about pesticides, so I've stuck with crickets. And as you can see, they're nice and big. I've had them for about three and a half, four years, and most of their diet has been crickets, and, and they're doing well. Molting is a very important part of the life of a tailless whip scorpion, and you need to provide for it. Like I said, they need enough space. They need to have enough space to kind of stretch out and uh, have space below them because they're going to hang from usually a vertical surface, although sometimes they'll hang from a horizontal surface, and uh, they will, their body will kind of slowly ooze out of their old exoskeleton using gravity to help them. So they need enough space to do that, and then um, they also need to be able to hang on securely, which is why the styrofoam or the cork bark works well. And then after they molt, they need to be left alone for uh, about a week so that they can um, sclerotize or their, their exoskeleton can harden up. And so they shouldn't have any prey animals like crickets in the enclosure with them when this happens. And they should also not be handled or be with other um, tailless whip scorpions. So they need to be alone for that process. When they're young, they were molting every few months, maybe every two to three months. And now that they're older, they only molt about once a year. And as long as they have you know, sufficient humidity, they're left alone to do it and they have plenty of space and they're not uh, bothered by any other organisms during that process. They usually go through it really well. I haven't had any problems, although I've heard that some people have had issues with that. Um, I haven't bred my tailless whip scorpions yet. I have had them mate once. You can distinguish the male and the female fairly easily when they're mature by looking at the pedipalps. The male's pedipalps are long enough that they extend past the first joint of their first pair of walking legs, which are behind the pedipalps. Um, we're not talking about the antenniform legs, but the walking legs. Their elbows, if you want to call it that, they're not really elbows, but um, those elbows extend past that first joint on the first pair of walking legs in the male, in the female they do not. Now when they're younger, that does not play out because as they, when they're younger, their, their pedipalps are much shorter in proportion to their body. 
they do a courtship dance and then the uh, result is a spermatophore that the male produces. Here's a picture of a spermatophore that I took from when mine um, mated. And after he produces it, he guides the female over it, she takes it in, and then the eggs are fertilized if the mating is successful. Now, I haven't had a successful mating. I've only attempted to breed them once. And now that I have a larger enclosure that I've set up for them that is completely lined with cork bark and with a nice hide for them to use, I'm going to be putting the male in here, letting him get used to the enclosure. And then when he is comfortable in there, I'll introduce the female. And of course, they'll be well fed at the time and give them a chance to mate and we'll see what we get. They've both molted fairly recently, so I don't have to worry about that interfering with the breeding process. Apparently, if the female molts after she's laid eggs, she will cast off the eggs and, and everything will be ruined because she keeps them on a pouch um, that is attached to her body, essentially. So we'll see how that goes. They're very fascinating creatures to watch, kind of hypnotic, definitely, as I said before, otherworldly. Um, there are various species that people keep. Some of them are bolder, some of them are shyer. This species, Daemon diadema, is a little bit on the shy end, but nevertheless, quite fascinating. And I hope you've learned something about tailless whip scorpions today, and I hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching. I post videos every Friday, all about aquarium and vivarium pets. Please feel free to rate, comment, share, and if you haven't already, subscribe. And then click the bell icon so you don't miss my next video.